with particular reference to information users. Our copyright law is 41 years old and broken. It has not been updated for education, research, libraries and archives since 1978 and has no provisions for the disabled. Fair dealing and limited exceptions do not address the digital world. Copyright is a statutory monopoly, but international treaties permit limitations and exceptions or legal flexibilities in national laws. These are already enjoyed by developed countries, yet our law is very few. Such flexibilities are fundamental for access to knowledge and thus for human and social development. For 21 years, the educational and library sectors have been calling for more balanced copyright laws. They challenged DTI proposals to amend the regulations in 1998 and the Act in 2000. Both sets of restrictive proposals were therefore removed from the Copyright Amendment Act of 2002. At the time, attempts by the South African University Vice Chancellor's Association and Committee of Technical Principles to reach agreement with rights owners on copyright exceptions were unsuccessful. The African Copyright and Access to Knowledge Project probed the relationship between national copyright environments and access to learning materials in eight African countries, including South Africa. A key finding was that copyright laws are at best unreliable access enablers. And where laws lack balance for information users, access to information is facilitated by infringing activities, not the copyright law. <laughs> 2009 saw the genesis of the current law, when the Department of Trade and Industry, DTI, commissioned the University of Pretoria to develop studies and positions, fair use included. In 2011, the DTI established a copyright review commission led by Judge Farlow to address artists' concerns that royalties were not being properly distributed to the rightful owners of copyright by collecting societies. The DTI also commissioned a WIPO study on the economic contribution of copyright-based industries in South Africa. Its findings state that the existence of a general fair use exception that can adapt to new technical environments may explain why search engines were first developed in the USA where users were able to rely on Also that the South African copyright regime does not include exceptions and limitations for the visually impaired or for the benefit of people with any disability, example, dyslexics, as well as for technological protection measures and electronic rights management information. Furthermore, despite the existence of exceptions for purposes of illustration, for teaching and research, the legal uncertainty surrounding the use of works has led to the conclusion of agreements between the collecting societies and educational establishments to the financial detriment of the latter. As exceptions have the potential to create value, we suggest that the DTI should review the Copyright Act in order to introduce limitations in, its, in accordance with the Berne Convention through step test and with the fair use provision and to clarify clauses as necessary. In 2013, the draft IG policy was published for comment, and phase one was passed in 2017. In 2014, a regulatory impact assessment was concluded. In 2018, the President approved the IP Laws Amendment Act of 2013, but this has not yet been promulgated. In his 2014 budget speech, Trade and Industry Minister Mr. Rob Davis announced that the existing intellectual property law regime requires a shift in order to take into account the trends and developments in the copyright environment and address key challenges that have been raised by artists. The Copyright Review Commission, which was headed by Judge Ian Farnham, made important rec recommendations which will improve access to education, regulate co collecting societies effectively and facilitate fair and speedy payment of royalties to rightful owners. He continued to say, we will propose amendments to the Copyright Act to bring an end to the plight of artists who continue to die as corpus. In this bill, we will also propose measures to regulate fair use and fair contract terms, given the challenges with contract negotiations within this industry. In 2015, the DTI held public consultations and in July published a draft amendment bill for public comment. In August, a multi-stakeholder conference was held 
and the deadline for submissions was extended to September. Many submissions were received by the DTI, resulting in more stakeholder workshops. Socioeconomic impact assessments were completed in 2016. The amendment bill was drafted within the framework of, or informed by, human rights and other international conventions and treaties, treaty proposals at WIPO by the Africa Group and IFLA and its alliance partners, the Eiffel model copyright law, appropriate clauses from progressive copyright regimes, the African Copyright and Access to Knowledge Project and SA Open Copyright Review, the SA Constitution, National Development and SDGs, and the 2015 Cape Town Declaration that commits South Africa to fair and balanced copyright laws. To address stakeholder comments and objections, the bill was revised during 2016 and presented to the Portfolio Committee on Trade and Industry in 2017. Fresh calls for submissions on the bill were published. Many submissions were made either supporting or opposing the bill. In early August 2017, a large number of stakeholders presented at the committee's public hearings. The Chair, Ms. Fubbs, invited additional but relevant information to be submitted to the committee. In October 2017, the ANC Legal Research Group convened a multi-stakeholder meeting in Sandton, which was streamed live for the public's benefit. Input on the bill was also sought from the National House of Traditional Leaders. Thereafter, the Portfolio Committee had many meetings to deliberate on the bill. Stakeholders had various opportunities to submit comments on revised versions and even on specific clauses. Many international organizations also made formal submissions. In February 2018, the committee appointed a small technical team that is an advocate from the Johannesburg Bar and some members from the Copyright Alliance made up of rights organizations to help it align the bill with the constitution and relevant policies. In May, the committee considered splitting the bill into two phases, but after objections, decided to keep it as one bill. The final bill is version five. The bill was approved by the Portfolio Committee on the 15th of November and by the National Council Assembly on the 5th of December, 2018. It was then referred to the National Council of Provinces for discussion on the 13th of February, 2019. Final submissions were called for by the 22nd of February. Further meetings were held on the 27th of February and the 6th of March. Tomorrow, the 20th, the National Council meets to adopt the bill and refer it for voting on the 28th of March. Once approved, it will go to the President for signature and enactment. Regulations will then be drafted to implement the provisions of the law. Unfortunately, there are those who do not want this bill and who have resorted to a prolonged campaign to stop the bill. Parallel to the bill's lengthy process, there has been a barrage of articles and interviews in the media by certain rights holders who embarked on a fear-mongering mission that has caused panic amongst authors, creators, and even academics who don't always understand the complexities of copyright law. There's also been much, much mischief in the media about the evils of fair use. For example, that fair use will be used by institutions to copy one book and make 2,000 copies for their students to avoid having to purchase books. And that fair use is carte blanche for piracy. Fair use is clearly misunderstood. That fair use will cause publishers to collapse and authors' rights will be damaged. This did not happen in any of the countries that do, do, that do have fair use. That authors and creators will die paupers. That is what the bill intends to change. That fair use is a foreign transplant and that the bill is digital colonialism. So what? Our current Copyright Act comes from the British model and its regulations are based on the US classroom guidelines. One has to wonder though whether these are not just red herrings to oppose regulation of collecting societies or to divert attention from scandals about non-payment of royalties, the diversion of members' funds into a failed high-risk investment in Dubai, and the Competition Commission's inquiry into the local publishing industry for alleged price fixing of textbooks and other publications going back to the 80s. And for a cherry on the top, a Samro board member has shared the following anti-Google piece on social media, 
using the invitation for this very seminar. So what do you believe? Fact or fiction? In conclusion, the bull is progressive, forward-looking, and goes a long way to redressing omissions and imbalances in our current copyright law. So why would you not support a bull that gives access and dignity to people with disabilities, facilitates access for research, teaching and learning, and social development, enhances creativity and innovation, and empowers authors and creators in the digital world. Updates and future proofs our copyright law for the 21st century and the fourth industrial revolution. Aligns South Africa's law with other progressive copyright regimes. Enables accessibility and preservation of library and related collections. Secures our cultural documentary her heritage. Regulates collecting societies to protect authors and creators from dying as paupers. Prevents unfair contracts from overriding legal exceptions. And most importantly, the bull benefits all stakeholders. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Denise. Um, so I'm, I'm Douglas Scott. I'm uh, from Wikimedia South Africa. We're one of the uh, hosting organizing organizations for this event today. Um, we're now going to have a, a quick um, presentation from everyone on this board, um, on this panel, about uh, why we believe, as users of copyright, uh, that the bill is important, important to us. Um, I suppose I might as well start. Um, so. Uh, there are basically two reasons why Wikimedia South Africa supports this bill. Sort of, first, a quick background about who Wikimedia South Africa is. We represent Wikipedia editors in South Africa. We are a membership-driven organization. We are entirely made up of volunteers. Um, the two reasons why we support the bill is, firstly, it's got something called Freedom Panorama. Uh, secondly, the other reason is because it's got fair use in it. Wikimedia South Africa unambiguously supports both of these things, and that's why we support the bill. The reason why fair use is so important to us came up, became apparent to us because um, when we ran a photographic competition inviting people to submit photographs of monuments in South Africa, uh, we realized that there was a whole class of monuments, the photographs of which, the media of which, we could not accept. Uh, Wikipedia and the Wikimedia community takes the strictest possible interpretation of copyright law, and um, because the current, the current act, the 1978 Copyright Act in South Africa, is so ambiguously written with regards to public monuments, it was the legal, our legal opinion, was the opinion of our legal advice, that should we accept photographs of recently built monuments, uh, we would be in the wrong we would not be allowed to distribute photographs of recently built monuments over the internet. This created a perverse situation whereby uh, photographs of colonial era monuments built 100 years ago or more, such as uh, Cecil John Rhodes um, and other colonial figures, could be freely photographed, shared over the internet, put on Wikipedia, no problem at all. But if we wanted to take photographs of recently built monuments, public artworks, uh, then such as statues of Nelson Mandela, for example, we would be prevented from doing so. We are prevented from people essentially, it's not just us, it's, it's everyone in society, are essentially prevented from taking photographs of st statues of struggle icons and sharing it over the internet, whether that be in Wikipedia, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, wherever. Um, and Freedom Panorama fixes that problem. The reason why we like fair use is because we feel it simplifies uh, copyright law, and currently, editing Wikipedia, um, one of the biggest stumbling blocks is navigating copyright law. Fair dealing, which is what South is currently done, is quite complicated. And if, if we can simplify that, and that's because of the list of exceptions, you need to be sort of very aware of what the exceptions are in order to navigate 
sort of uh, editing Wikipedia and navigating the copyright legislation in South Africa. Fair, de fair use greatly simplifies that, makes copyright law more publicly accessible. There are other reasons as well, but that's the main reason why the reason organizations support it. There's a third reason as well, and that is and that it future proofs South African copyright law makes it better for the technology industry, but you'll, you'll hear more, from, more on that from other panelists. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Yulabide Mohabi. I teach video game design at Vets University. Um, I'm also owner of the company called Fish Knife Interactive, which develops video games. Um, I've been researching on video games for, for me quite many years. So um, what I'm going to be doing tonight, I'm going to be speaking about um, the creative technology sector um, and a little bit about how FAMES and uh, the Copyright Amendment Bill affects uh, practitioners within the tech sector or the creative tech sector um, within the fourth industrial revolution. But I'll just give a very broad overview because I mean I can go technical as a, as a scholar within the field. First, let me talk a bit about video games. Uh, video games is quite a new industry in South Africa, I would say fairly new. Um, yes, there is a, a mushrooming of companies um, in Cape Town, Johannesburg, and Durban, and um, there is um, an upsurge within um, the culture of gaming in South Africa, which means there will be um, new types of jobs that will mushroom over the years. Um, hence, the University pioneered a um, course in video game design uh, within the digital arts um, division. So what happens is that what I've noticed um, as a researcher is that other scholars from Scandinavian countries and other European countries and so on um, have been doing quite extensive research on the creative side as well as um, academic scholarly side, which speaks to the idea of fair use as key among um, what they have to apply in order to create um, new forms of, 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 of video games. Um, and also, I mean, presently, I'm currently developing a video game which is a tribute to the late Willy Mandela. And uh, within that, I've been using user-generated content from the internet, um, which on its own, it speaks to the idea of fair use because um, perhaps since it's publicly generated, um, the content that's on, it, that's on the internet, it creates um, a situation within one can apply the principles of fair use when creating um, a particular product or even a service for that matter. I'm just going to go through the quick notes that I've prepared for you today. Most permissionless innovations mushroomed as a result of fair use. Search engines linking device interoperability all came from or existed as a result from limitations and exceptions to copyright. Consumer-driven economy, which is also highly driven by fair use, or the knowledge-driven economy, and uh, the emerging technologies as well as gaming, as I've mentioned, are all reshaping information dissemination, information consumption, recreating, and transaction. Based on that, I would counsel that policymakers should consider making laws that facilitate diversity in creative practices. Thirdly, the innovation ecosystem or the fourth industrial revolution, as well as video games, they hold a very good promise to a future of new jobs in South Africa, as I've mentioned. But the hierarchical or the vertical nature of the structures is currently getting challenged um, through not permitting fair use in South Africa. So which means that limits the scope of innovation and creating new products and creating new jobs in a way. Fourthly, policymakers and researchers should assist the country in creating an IP regime which sets core principles that police unfair conduct and foster norms that facilitate the production of knowledge goods and access to global marketplace on competitive rather than on monopolistic terms. Then um, lastly, I'm going to speak to what I 
referred to as progressive pluralism. The fourth industrial revolution and its subclassifications, including video games, fermented in sectors least affected by strict regulations of the international copyright framework. These platforms for creativity and consumption have to date disrupted the political, cultural, and innovation spaces. Because as we've always noticed that uh, new technologies and new innovations have always scared people. But um, for fair use um, advocates, what we are looking at is that we can create um, a new regime within which um, we all speak um, from a pluralistic point of view. I thank you. and I'm a student at the University of Constant Torture, University of Colonial Thinking, otherwise commonly known as the University of Cape Town. And I want to be very clear that I am a fallist. That's the political ideology that I buy into and that I advocate for and will for my entire life. And we are all familiar with Rose Must Fall, and we are familiar with Peace Must Fall. But what needs to be understood is that these were brought about as a need for the South African supposedly post-apartheid um, society to have a radical change. That issues of transformation have been window dressing at best, and that in particular the institution, we find that there are still colonial ideas that inform how the university operates, how it um, allows for students to function, but most importantly, that these, these, these colonial tenants are preventing access. So Rose Must Fall was particularly about kind of the, the symbolism on campus, um, about how black students are regarded, but particularly Fees Must Fall spoke to the financial aspect to university. The university of Cape Town has the highest fees um, in the country and Beyond just the fees, which we were quite aware of, there's a hidden cost behind textbooks that is also a barrier to access for the students. Let me provide you a, an example, an anecdote from my own life. I was a student of computer science, and we all know that computer science is an is a, is a industry that, that often changes. And on the Friday, we had a lecture where we were told this is the textbook, we were given the name, the uh, ISBN number, and I went to find it, and I found out that this is an American textbook that would cost about 1,200 rand. The expectation was for me to get the textbook by Monday. This was Friday. Mind you, there are about two textbook shops that are nearby UCT, one on the actual campus and one on Railroad Rondebosch, so it almost becomes a, a hunger game to get access to a textbook. One has to call ahead, one has to either order online, one has to do quite, quite significant gymnastics to get access to a textbook. But beyond that, it's the financial cost of it. It's the fact that at the beginning of the year, one has to pay a registration, and beyond paying registration fees, needs to, we need to buy textbooks that are often quite exorbitant. So by the Monday, I had managed to, to find this copy after having to essentially figure out where I'm going to find 1,200 Rand within a three-day period. And on the Monday, the lecturer had casually mentioned that they have bought a, the e-book for all of us and it is available on our online portal. And it was in that moment when I truly understood that the lecturers and the administration of the university is very far removed from the struggles that textbook cause us. The Mail of Guardian did a, a very brief. The Mail of Guardian had done a very brief review and had discovered that, on average, textbooks cost about five thousand rand for a student studying at any of our institutions across our country, and that so, uh, textbook allowances from bursaries and from NESFAS are often at about three three thousand rand or two thousand five hundred. 
So there, there, there's a quite a gap between access to money to buy the, these textbooks that often for the black student, for the average black South African who finds themselves at these institutions of higher learning, getting access to a bit of textbooks is often, often, often asking your family to not eat for a few weeks so that you can get this textbook and that you can get an opportunity to, to bring yourself and your family and your community out of poverty. And this is where fair use and fair dealing comes in. Because the fair, the fair dealing provisions that exist criminalize us accessing knowledge and education. The library tries as best as can with its limited budget to buy textbooks on behalf of courses that have about 1,200 students where only four textbooks are purchased for that course. We can obviously see that, that problems are created, particularly when tests arrive and there are four textbooks, there are 2,000 students and obviously there's tensions about being able to access that textbook. It is illegal for us as students to photocopy textbooks, chapters. Now, we're not advocating for piracy, not photocopying the entire textbook and bounding it and, and selling it as, as a textbook, but rather to access the chapter that's necessary for us to learn and to, to progress. So the key issue is that fair use and the fair use provision will allow for the textbook matter that is quite an ignored aspect to access to allow it to be an accessible element for um, our education. There's also in particular access for, for Braille and access for people with disabilities that the fair use provision would allow for translating existing copyrighted textbooks into Braille so that these communities can access that knowledge. If we're truly committed to the decolonial project and we're truly committed to access of information and education, then it's, it's a natural conclusion that we'll support Fair Dealing. Because this is how we can create robust um, legislation that doesn't need to be amended every five years to keep up with technological advancements. But when it comes to Fees Must Fall and when it comes to Fallism, it is very clear that the Fallist position would support Fair Dealing. <laughs> My name is Disi Pagani, I'm an independent ICT consultant. You can't hear? Yeah. Yes. Hello? Better? Yes. Better like this? Oh, okay, cool. Um, I will say good evening and thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Disi Pagani, I'm an independent ICT consultant, so I'm no longer with the Freedom of Expression Institute, but I would still like to talk about the Copyright Amendment Bill um, within the context of guaranteeing the right to freedom of expression and access to information, particularly in a digital world. So I think we're aware of the Section 161 right in particular that protects the right to freedom of expression, and this includes the freedom of the press and other media. It includes the freedom to receive or impart information or ideas, the freedom of artistic creativity and academic freedom, and uh, freedom of scientific research. We're also aware that within the Constitution there's a Section 32 right that further guarantees the right of access to information. So we can see from our Constitution that there are very serious provisions that are made for access to information, access to knowledge, access to um, ideas. And as a society, we really have come um, a long way in terms of knowledge and information um, production as a result particularly of digital technology. So if you look back, I mean, I suppose you, you weren't around then, but if you think about the kind of 19th century and how information and knowledge was um, produced and consumed, it was limited particularly by the physical ability of a printing press to actually make copies and distribute those copies. And digitization has completely um, changed all of that. So we now access and consume information and knowledge in ways that we didn't um, prior to that. And that's also enhanced then the ability to express ourselves differently based on the kinds of um, information that we're, we're consuming. So if you think about self-publishing, I think Rulamile mentioned earlier about user-generated um, content. He mentioned briefly that he is um, working on a video game based on William Mandela, but he's doing so based on 
what other users on the internet have generated. And they've also got, at the moment, this kind of Woody's Water Challenge and how A, that's gone viral, and also the number of expressive responses that have come up in response to that. And that's all as a result of you know, the digital age and digital technology. So we see that digitization has enabled the creation of new expressive um, works. And I think in particular that creators in a digital environment need to make use of underlying kind of creative works of other authors or other creators in order to be able to produce new and, and different and, and expressive works. So the DTI really is to be commended for their attempts to bring South Africa in line with the digital age. And I think the challenge, obviously, to, cop to balance those kind of complementary or competing rights in terms of the rights of authors and the rights of users in terms of copyrighted material. They've been able to do this largely through the inclusion of the fair use provisions, which I think you know, most of the other panel members have spoken um, about which really strive to bring a more open and more balanced and more flexible um, exceptions within our current copyright um, regime that responds in particular to the changes in technology. So I think Denise mentioned in her presentation that exceptions aren't anything new within our copyright um, legislation and environment. I think though that where the DTI where we find ourselves as a country and as a global community is really needing to ensure that the exceptions that we're thinking about are future-proof and they enable a range of other kind of uses that weren't imagined in 1978 when the Copyright Amendment um, Act was being drafted. So I think that the fair use provisions also respond to changes in the expressive landscape. Um, if you think of mashups, um, video game developers like Rulan Lula, for example. And the fair use exceptions further increase access to information and knowledge for people living with disabilities. Um, the provisions for librarians, um, education, archives, research, museums, digitization, format shifting, um, and the preservation of, of collections. Fair use exceptions also enhance access to information and freedom of expression by accommodating a range of new uses such as machine learning or virtual reality, cloud computing, data mining, search engine indexing, etc. And the one criticism has been that they at least tend to um, benefit or favor technology companies. And I think that that's because obviously tech companies are the early kind of adapters um, and they need to rely on um, these various, uh, these, these various uh, provisions in order to provide the services that we as users um, use. So the digital age requires us to think differently about what we make of information or knowledge, how we access information and knowledge, how we use information and knowledge, and also the different steps along that kind of um, information pathway. So we often need to access underlying or other data in order to produce new and meaningful um, information in a way that doesn't infringe on the expressive components of the original um, author or the underlying kind of original work. So the Copyright Amendment Bill has been an opportunity to think differently about how we access knowledge and information, particularly in a digital age where information and access to information is a basic human right. And within the context of the fourth industrial revolution in particular, that enhanced access to information and information is, is necessary to support this growing knowledge economy that um, Ulamina referred to um, earlier. I will leave it there for now. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, not great technology advanced. Um, thank you to our first panel. We just thought it would be better in terms of structure to have both panelists speak. So this panel pretty much just encompassed what it means to actually recreate works and what it means for users of the bill, how it will actually affect them in terms of recreating works from first-hand experience of how the previous legislation has affected them and how the new legislation will actually make that jump shift and what repercussions will have for the using and the recreating industry. Um, I'm going to do a young swap over to our second panelist, who are some academic professionals who will speak more on the technicalities of the bill, 
and get down to the nitty-gritty of all of the terms you can kind of see in the handout that we gave. There's from the back. There's a layout breakdown of the bill, um, provision by provision, so you can kind of get a more in-depth overview of what the bill and what each of the provisions propose and the way forward. So we'll reserve questions for after the second panel, just so you get the most holistic picture of everything that's going on before you come with the questions. That's okay. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. All all partners will still be present for the questions. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Oh yeah. Are we still warming up? <laughs> You go first, eh? You go yeah. first. And then you go. Excellent. And then buy us. Okay. <laughs> Well, I didn't do anything different to Denise's presentation. I didn't do anything different to Denise's presentation. Give it a second. Is it going to disappear? No. This. I can't see you in the camera. Yeah, well, that's fine. We can help you. Help you. Do you want to move it? What's fine? Can you They say they say they can't hear anything. I haven't said anything yet. I haven't said anything. Oh, no, they just they just give it a feedback. They should be hearing a piece of background. So should I put the mic there if I'm going to say? I don't want to say I'm not planning on going all the way up and down. I'm just planning on saying that I'm going to do it. And if I can't do it, I'm Okay, um, if you guys are ready, we have Betty Jane up first, and she'll take it away for the second half. Thank you, Betty. Thank you very much. I'm going to try and go without the mic, if I'm audible, if you can all hear me. Um, and I'm going to open by focusing on financial expenditure within uh, South African higher education. Yes. I have a short one here, right in front of me. Are we good on sound, mister? We're good on sound. Okay. So, just to start off, as we know, Plan C 
with regards to flipping the model with, um, in terms of uh, the, the European subscription system. Um, it's one of the ways that individuals and organizations and funding agencies are trying to change the current subscription model. But I think what is very important is what comes from the Max Planck Digital Library White Paper on Large Scale Transformation to Open Access, and that is that we need a combination of legal reform as well as financial structure reform. With regard to the South African Higher Education Institution, over the last five years, libraries lost 50% of their buying power. This was due to exponential price hikes, budget cuts, inflation, economic recessions, and currency fluctuations. So just to run you through, through some of these issues with regards to expenditure. And what we're talking about here is we're talking about royalty-free publications. Okay? So just to be clear, this is royalty-free. It's scientific publications. All right. So what we've seen is a 300% increase in subscription fees over the last 10 years. We've also determined that about 75% of the income to those publishers comes from library budgets. Libraries are now leasing instead of owning material, where in the past you could buy the journal, put it on your shelf, take it off and use it. Now it works pretty much like your DSTV subscription. As soon as you stop paying, you get cut off. If you don't have a clause in your contract with them to keep back files or access to back files, you will be locked out of the system, which means every year you keep on paying for the same material. We also see entrapment of libraries through what the signing of long-term agreements as well as non-disclosure agreements where you are not allowed to make public what you are paying for the service that you are leasing. We are seeing large-scale cancellations of subscriptions. We're also seeing takeovers by large conglomerate publishers with regards to societal journals and small publishers. We also know from the statistics that about 50% of all knowledge is owned by only five publishing houses. Some of these publishing houses make profit margins of over 36%. And in the case of open access with regards to article processing charges, in terms of the hybrid model, one of these publishing houses increased their profit margin with 76% in only one year. What we need in South Africa direly is some empirical research. We do not have any national body that collects data on the payments that universities and science councils make in South Africa with regards to national and international book buying, national and international electronic resources, import taxes, VAT, interlibrary loans, open access article publishing charges, copyright fees, textbooks, and hidden costs. So what we've done is we've done a little bit of our own digging. A colleague and I looked at how much information can we obtain from higher education. We received 14 responses, of which one stated they, that they cannot make public um, the, info, the information. But out of the 13 institutions, 13 out of 26, so that's 50 percent, we discovered the following. But in 2018, we spent close to a billion rand on buying electronic resources and books for libraries. We have also paid close to 70 million rand for blanket and transactional licenses to Dalro. 95% of the consortia deals in South Africa, universities work through Sanlik, a consortia body. 95% of those consortia deals are with international publishers 
and only 5% with local industry. It's also estimated that together with the, book, the books and the other resources, that 80% of this money actually leaves the country. So everybody wants to change the world, but nobody wants to change. I attended a session yesterday by the DG of the Department of Science and Technology launching the white paper on artificial intelligence. And I think this is a wonderful screenshot in showing the risk of increased digitalization. And if you look at my little orange circle, knowledge services are within the category of high likelihood of being disrupted, meaning having an impact on income, wealth, and jobs. And I think it's incredibly important that we start to change, and that change should also start with libraries. So if you look at the article that appeared in Science with regards to Sci-Hub as to who actually uses um, this uh, pirate service, it basically said that everybody's using it. And in response as to why you're using it, a lot of academics stated that they use it because it's easy to actually get access. They don't have to click so many times to get to the actual article that they want. With regard to the publication on shadow libraries, there's a wonderful um, case study on South Africa that indicates that 65% of textbooks that we buy in South Africa actually comes from international publishing houses, and that might be outside of the country as well as international publishers having offices in South Africa. We also know that the book industry has adopted change where they allow for instance, for or engage in negotiations directly with universities to add the cost of the textbook to the class fees. And it has been determined that even if these publishers give 60% discount to universities, they still make more money than what they would if this was done through trade, where students had to go to a bookshop and actually buy that. As mentioned, there's also the Competition Commission um, inquest into price fixing with regards to um, uh, PASA. And we also know that these new online um, platforms add to blended learning. I would like to just point out to the idiot who created um, this that um, if he or she actually used Google, they would know that I am not a WITS academic. They would also know that I am myself a published writer. I also have a PhD in publishing studies. I have a master's degree in creative writing. I have worked as a publisher full-time for close to a decade of my life, and I still contribute to the publishing industry through freelance work. I have worked on more than 80 publications. So if I am regarded as not a creator, I am also the editor of a book on creative writing that includes a chapter on legal services that is the only available publication in that field within the Afrikaans market. I thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Sean Flynn. I'm from American University, which is in Washington, D.C. And I've been doing um, 
intellectual property and development research projects in South Africa for the last 10 years, and doing different kinds of uh, constitutional rights research projects here for the last 20 years. I spent uh, 1999 to 2001 uh, working for uh, Justice Arthur Chaskelson on the Constitutional Court and teaching at the University of its Fox Group. So that's kind of my connection um, to this country. And, but right now the connection to this topic is that it appears that the most controversial aspect of this bill, reading the various op-eds and things being put out by the collective management organizations and the international publishing community, has been around this concept of fair use that we're talking about today. And that is indeed an imported concept from American law. So I want to tell you a little bit about what it is and describe a little bit about how it's the international trend today as countries are undergoing copyright reform around the world. About a little bit about what we know about why it's good for you and then to dispel some of the myths that we've been seeing in, in various op-eds, etc. So first, kind of what, what fair use is, the difference between fair use and fair dealing. So two kind of very copyright lawyer terms. And the truth is there's very little difference between the two. It's literally two words. Those two words are such as. So it's an opening clause. So both fair use and fair dealing are what we call a general exception. So you have a series of specific exceptions in your law, as does the United States. Exceptions for libraries, exceptions for education, etc. We both have all of those. And both of us, because we come from the common law tradition that started in England, have a general purpose right as well that first came out of the courts through common law and was later in both countries put in statute. And when the UK put their general right in statute, they did not include those such as. So they listed a whole bunch of different general purposes that you could use a work for. So for criticism and review, for educational use, the use in the course of teaching. But then they had a full stop, right? That's it. If it's one of those things, then you can use the work as long as your use is fair. It's a fair dealing. The word dealing and use mean exactly the same. It means any kind of activity for one of those purposes is lawful if that use is fair to the author, which essentially means you're not competing with them in the marketplace. You're not uploading it to some web. You're not just taking a record and reproducing or a book and just reproducing, right? So you're using it for some other purpose. So you're quoting a work, for instance. You're using an excerpt to prove your point. Nobody's going to buy your criticism of the book instead of the book that you're criticizing, right? You can write about Shakespeare or write about some modern author, right? And you're allowed to quote that person without paying them. You're allowed to quote that person without even asking them. And that's important for the principles that Tusi was mentioning, right? Free expression. If we require you to ask permission in order to use someone else's work as part of your creation of your own work, then that enables a system of private censorship. It enables that copyright holder to say, I don't want you to quote my work, and therefore you may not publish that piece. And we don't allow you to do that anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. In fact, the international fabric requires that every country have a right of so the magic I mentioned in fair use is those words such as that it includes all of those same purposes as the UK law does, but before that list of purposes it says you may use a fair use of a work for purposes such as the following. And that's enabled courts, our law was passed in 1976, to adapt that use right to technologies over time. So our law, for instance, was created, was written before the invention of the video cassette recorder, right? Which allows you to copy shows that you already have a right to listen to and watch them at a later time, time shifting. And you can fast forward up to the present, all the different kinds of copying you do on your computer, on your phone, in your everyday life. In fact, when you search the internet, you're not searching the internet, you're searching a copy of the internet. 
So if you don't have some mechanism to authorize copies that do not compete with the author, in fact, many of these uses help the author, right? The ability to search for a web page doesn't compete with the web page, it draws consumers to the web page. So that's what Fair Use says. Fair Use says you don't have to be listed. As long as your use is fair, then you can use it. It takes out that listing step. Okay. So as I mentioned, the first point is that this is the international standard. So this is on, on a research, and this is based on some research we did. We surveyed, surveyed um, 40 countries around the world, um, large middle-income countries, South Africa is, is one of them, um, and compared the copyright laws in the wealthier and the developing countries. And what you find is that the wealthier countries have been quicker to adopt legislation, to adopt exceptions that are open in that way that fair use is. So fair use is open along four categories. So for the different kinds of activities you can use, fair dealing is open in that way as well. For the different kind of users, and fair dealing is open in that way as well. The different kinds of rights, so copyright gives you reproduction, display rights, etc., and fair dealing is open that as well. But then also the purposes that can be used, and that is where fair dealing is not open. So it's that last step, open to purpose, that fair use gets you. And so when we survey laws around the world, what we found is that laws generally, if you go across the time axis, become more open at that time. Whether they're specific exceptions or general exceptions, more and more countries are opening their laws to different kinds of works, different kinds of users, etc. But the developing countries in our sample are about 30 years behind, if you look at the timeline, the richer countries. And that gives a development advantage to the richer countries. If your law doesn't allow you to copy for non-competitive uses on the internet, then you can't do those kind of technologies. You can't develop artificial intelligence or machine learning, for instance, in a country that doesn't allow the copying of information for non-competitive reasons. Not for the purpose of putting a book on the internet so everybody can download it, but for the purpose of reading that book with the machine in order to analyze it. So globally, we talk about you know, the right to read is a right to mind. It's true under fair use, but it's not true under your law now. So where are the areas in which the laws are more restrictive in developing countries than wealthier countries? So the wealthier countries are on the right-hand side and the poorer countries are on the left-hand side. And the answer is across the board, but often in the most important exceptions. So even though most countries have an education exception, for instance, in the poorer countries, those education exceptions tend to be more restricted. They might only talk about literary works, for instance, and not the ability to use audiovisual works. They might only talk about the rights of teachers and not the rights of students. So having a, an education right is not new. But having an education right that applies across the different uses, cabined by a fairness test, is yet what you're going for. It enables that teacher, for instance, to stream a video in a classroom, not just make a single copy of a, of a page of a little book. So fair use is good for you. So we've done some empirical research on this, and what you find is that as countries become more open in their copyright exceptions, that that actually leads to more scholarship being produced in those countries. So we did before and after tests where we looked at when countries opened their copyright laws and associated them with more production of scholarship. The other is an, is an economic point. So, High technology companies invest more in countries that have more open copyright regimes. And the answer is simple, they can do more in those countries. So companies that are investing in some of those modern artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc., won't invest in the countries that don't permit that activity. Okay, so what does your law do? So this, this is essentially a little chart of just what we call the creator's rights 
of those rights that allow uh, the creation of different kinds of materials for different kinds of purposes. And the basic thrust is that on each category, if you look at the analysis, the law is taking mostly what already exists in your law already, so you already have education rights and library rights, etc., but rewriting them to follow the international trend, to make each exception applicable to all kinds of works, for instance. This is one of the biggest flaws in your current act, in that every exception in your current act, if you read it, there's a specific exception for a specific kind of work. So here's what you can do with audiovisual works. And then they miss some. So for instance, the incidental use right that allows you to use a copyrighted work in the background of another work doesn't cover audiovisual works. It only covers artistic works. So you can capture a painting in the background of your documentary film, but you can't capture a television. And documentary filmmakers don't even know this. So one of the things that was brought up earlier is that fair use simplifies your copyright law. Absolutely. Because all you have to know is, am I displacing or substituting for the original work? And if the answer is no, you can assume the use is fair. In your current law, you have to go through about 30 pages of different exceptions, and you actually have to cross-reference them to each other, because they'll have an exception, and then later on, and Tobias laughs because he's done it. <laughs> later on, you know, five pages later, it says something like, you know, and for audiovisual works, the exception in 12 through 13, but not 12b, apply mutatis mandatus. And so you have to like figure that out. So real people don't do that, right? Real people don't look through that and try to find what their rights are through this complaint. So this is kind of the radical change, which is essentially taking the existing law and opening it up a little bit. And so you can kind of ask yourself through the debate whether this is really the problem or not that, that the various folks on the other side are complaining about. But I would argue that what's going on in your copyright reform now is useful, but honestly, not especially radical. So here's just kind of an overview, and there's a little fact sheet in the back if, if, if people want to you know, have the, the larger arguments, but the overview of the main myths around fair use theory. Um, so first, uh, there's, there's some publishers arguing that it breaches international law. It clearly does not. So there are at least eight different countries around the world that have fair use right now. Most of them passed within the last decade. Nobody's been challenged under international law. The United States have fair use since the 1970s. Um, there's just really no credible argument that that's true. So it's not a free-for-all. This is the non-radical point, right? So the key part of fair use is that you can't substitute for the work in a market. So you're not going to disrupt massive markets because the fair use law itself prohibits you from doing that. The, the education right does not allow, as, as Denise was saying, the copying of whole books to displace markets in order just to save costs. What it does allow you to do is make copies of excerpts. And it clarifies that under, under existing law. So it has a very broad and liberal right to use the excerpts for educational purposes. But that's not going to kill the publishing market, because it doesn't allow you to make public copies of entire books. The one circumstance when it does allow it is if that book is not made available in the market at all. But in that case, you're not displacing the market, because the market's not being served. Doesn't shift the burdens of proof. That's kind of a legal technicality. Did not harm the Canadian publishing industry. So this, this gets batted around a lot. And so Canada recently expanded its fair dealing provision to include fair, to, to include fair uh, educational uses, which did broaden its exceptions. And the response of that was a decrease in licensing of universities, but overall educational material purchases maintain the same. And so what you found afterwards was publishers were doing just fine, but they were no longer, libraries were now spending on actual materials instead of photocopying rights to pay extra money for excerpts. So at the end of the day, budgets stayed the same, but you had more materials available to students. Fair use actually doesn't drive up litigation. There's very little litigation in the United States on copyright for fair use. This isn't an area where where you're going to import a lot of litigation, and 
litigation hasn't gone up in, in any other countries. It adopted fair use. And then finally, the Google point. So the perception among some is that fair use is what enables YouTube to use music. And that's not true. Licensing is what enables YouTube to use music. So YouTube actually has a very sophisticated content ID system that takes down any work that includes music or other copyrighted content unless the copyright holder elects to get paid. So there's very little actual fair use on YouTube. The reason Google likes fair use is because internet search, which is their core business, literally copies the entire internet. So unless you have a, a right to either fair use, broad and simple right, or some kind of right for non-consumptive uses of material, then internet search is literally illegal. So that kind of wraps up that. And um, now I think to Tobias can be take it through a South African video. Thank you. Uh, just assuming it starts working automatically, great. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Tobias Schoenwetter. I'm an associate professor at uh, the university that was introduced by one of the previous panelists, the University of Cape Town, um, and I'm also the director of um, the Intellectual Property Research Unit um, at this university. So um, I thank you all for coming, of course. Uh, it's good to see uh, so many familiar faces and also so many new faces. It's uh, good to know that probably quite a few more people are also uh, listening and watching us uh, online. Um, but I'm also particularly pleased that we do have in the audience uh, a couple of uh, future law and policy makers in Africa that obviously take the message that, uh, that comes out of the presentations that we heard so far, hopefully to uh, their um, uh, their countries, and uh, when, I, when I say this, I'm not, of course, uh, referring to my students in my IP class at the University of Cape Town that are coming from all over, over Africa. So thanks for coming in particular. So we, we heard already a, a couple of uh, details um, of, uh, of what's in the, in the bill and what's really not in the bill, and um, I, will, um, uh, I will approach this whole thing a little bit more high level. Basically, I will share with you a couple of perceptions from, a, from an academic perspective as, as to what this bill really is. And, and it's not about, and I want to actually start off with you, if that is okay, by telling you the story of how I actually became involved in all these discussions, because uh, as you can probably hear, yeah, I'm, I'm not from South Africa, I'm important myself, but I've been here since 2003. Um, and certainly when I came to South Africa as a, as a German uh, master's student, um, and you would have asked me back then, um, uh, so you want to want to change your copyright laws? What should we be doing? I would certainly suggest that well, just ramp up the protection, and uh, that is good for creators, and that by extension also good for for uh, for your country and for society at large. And then um, I said, what what then happened was um, that I then came across a map. Uh, one of those maps that World Mapper produces. I'm not sure whether people in the audience have ever looked at these kind of maps that World Mapper produces. They produce maps on all sorts of issues. But one of the issues are, are actually uh, intellectual property royalty flows. So what, what, what is so interesting, what World, world Mapper actually does, it first shows you the world like we all know it, right? So the globe, basically, with all these countries and, and, and boundaries and all this, and it looks very familiar to you. There's Africa, there's Europe, and there's the... Uh, Americas and so forth, and uh, and Africa as the second biggest continent, of course, is very prominent on this list. And then um, you click on a button, really, on the button that then shows you the world depicted in terms of royalty flows, intellectual property royalty flows. So where does the money actually go to that is being made in the context of intellectual property? Press the button. <laughs> Africa disappeared. It really literally disappears in front of you. Um, and uh, the North Americas and, uh, and the Europe become bigger and bigger. Um, and that really started to, it put a seed in my, I didn't like, completely change my views then, uh, but it certainly put a seed in my head um, that I thought, well, I want to actually do some, uh, some, some more research. And um, the question that really uh, kept me going was that how a framework, intellectual property generally, and then more particularly copyright as, as being one of the subcategories of that, how a framework like this that so obviously discriminates against us and the global south, um, how can we improve that system? How can we make it work better for us? 
in, in, the, in the global south. So I did start uh, to do my own research, but I also teamed up with dozens and dozens of colleagues from all over Africa, really, in research projects. Some of them were already mentioned here, ACA UK, the African Copyright to Access, uh, African Copyright and Access to Knowledge project being one of the, uh, I think, I, I guess, path-breaking uh, projects at first, but, but, uh, but other, uh, many other projects followed after that. And um, I also commenced PhD studies on this. I actually uh, decided to write my PhD thesis on the issue of copyright exceptions and limitations. Um, and, and that's obviously one of the key areas that the bill now tackles and um, that, that, that we've heard quite, quite a bit of. So, that's 15 years now. For the last 15 years, literally, I've learned a number of, of really important lessons, probably like a, like a dozen or so that are worth sharing. But I think in the interest of time, let me just share with you four of the very important lessons that I've learned that I think are important to understand the kind of policy, law and policy discussions that, that we are finding ourselves are making at the moment. Because at the end of the day, um, and whether we like it or not, some of the discussions um, that, um, uh, that, that, that we have right now about certain um, uh, provisions in the law, whether or not we will have these provisions are policy decisions. It's not that there is really a right or wrong. It, it is that the lawmaker has decided that that a certain emphasis needs to be put on, for example, um, access mechanisms because of the developmental concerns, and, uh, for an example. So, so bottom line is, um, I, let me just share um, these, uh, these four lessons that, that I've identified here as, as being relevant. The first one is, despite what we really often hear, um, the African countries that we have looked in in our research, and that includes South Africa for sure, um, fully comply with the levels of protection that international law requires us to protect. Well, the levels of protection are not like kind of uh, low or inappropriate or, or violating international uh, law. Um, in fact, what, uh, what we have really seen is that, it, that, uh, that um, we uh, often go beyond those minimum standards that, for example, the TRIPS uh, agreement um, requires us to do. So in the bill, we have analyzed that and the bill is not going to change that. In fact, it will actually allow us to then also join um, and ratify uh, several of the other um, uh, treaties that, that we haven't uh, as yet ratified. That's the first thing, even though we heard um, that uh, the opposite is true. Um, that's not what, what our, our analysis yields. Second point is that there is no question that, um, uh, that artists and creators really do struggle. And there is a plot of artists, and we, we, uh, I think whoever does not want to talk about that issue, I kind of think has to hide something. Uh, but at the same time, um, I think when we really look for options of how we can tackle that, we will very quickly be taken outside of copyright, because I'm afraid copyright really doesn't have the answer that we are looking for to solve the problems that creators, I'm not talking of the rights owners, who are often different people to the, to the actual creators, but um, the, the, the creators are facing. As far as copyright is concerned, I have asked myself the question as a copyright holder, what can we do to help? And there's really only two things that I have identified that we could do. First, we need to perhaps do a little bit more on the enforcement level. So we have all these rights already, but what perhaps doesn't work quite as well is how we enforce these rights. So there is something that we can um, that, that we can kind of, uh, kind of tweak and that, that might help. But then also, and I think this is also what the bill tries to tackle now, is that often the plight of creators is actually the result of exploitative contractual agreements between the creators and those who then eventually own their material. Um, and um, again, rather than lack of sufficient protection, and I think that the, the uh, bill with uh, some of its uh, provisions around um, uh, about um, uh, the content of, of, of certain provisions is trying to actually tackle that. But outside those two, I really do see very little wiggle room as to using copyright as a means of, uh, of, of improving, improving the plight. The plight is a result of the current system, by the way. So it's not that they, uh, that they are struggling because of what we are proposing in the bill now, but it's because of what we currently have in the bill. So that, again, is actually uh, underscoring the fact that change is, is, is needed. Third. Um, so the existing, we heard that already, I'm just actually mirroring and, uh, and repeating what, what Denise said earlier. Our research, and what you heard here in the last 20 minutes, is much more substantiated, substantiated I hope you see, than many of the counter-arguments that we were heard about, just throwing in out, basically, without much um, uh, a substantiation, perhaps a commission study here, there, but other than that, uh, I haven't seen much. Um, so what we found in our research in, that, um, uh, that engaged with uh, stakeholders on the ground in, in 
many African countries is that domestic copyright exceptions, as they exist, including the ones that we have in South Africa, do not work very well. And we need to do something about it. People just do not rely on them in as much as they should. Because do remember, copyright exceptions and limitations are that key balancing tool between protection on the one side and access on the other side. We're doing well, as I said, on the one side, but we're not doing well on the other side. So the balance is all of touch, right? So we need to readjust. And I think, again, this is uh, what this uh, bill is is trying to do. And then fourth, and lastly, as, those, uh, as these points are concerned, and we heard that from Letty in particular, and, and much more um, uh, coherently than, than I would ever be able to do it, is that the cost of education materials are really exploding at the moment. They're getting off hand. Um, it's not only the students that are, that, that are, um, that are suffering. Um, they should do. But it's also actually the educational institutions, because yes, we have the the fee income, but actually a large bulk of the fee income comes in and goes out again, right? Because we actually try to um, to pay for all the um, licenses and, uh, and and so forth that um, that, that have been going up uh, um, over the years. In fact, you, you know that from from, from uh, popular media, I suppose, the better, much better healed university in the global north um, have recently uh, cancelled contracts with Elsevier, for example, because. Um, they just cannot afford it any longer, and they, they also feel that through accessing open access material, they can they, they can bridge the gap between what they lose and, and uh, what they can still um, still access. So if these better, much better off universities in the global global south uh, global north start to struggle, you can only imagine what this means for UCT. But UCT still can do it, I suppose. One time. But there is much worse university off uh, university universities are much worse off. Um, in, in South Africa than, than UCT is, and I think it's these educational institutions, including schools, that we actually need to not, uh, not, not forget about. So it's also, and I always make this point because my students love this, right? Because I ask my students, what do you think about the current publishing system? Um, who do you think is actually owning most of the most of the content, right? And then I, I split them up by raise of hands. Do you think it's the creator or is it the university? And then it's all usually a 50-50. Who says that the publisher should own the material that is actually published by the academic? It's literally close to zero every time. By law, who act, or not by law, by actually contract, by contract practices. Goodness gracious, three minutes left. Um, it is oftentimes the publisher. And so again, we need to we need to readjust our practices that, that somehow have, have gotten out of hand. So as a, I made this point earlier when I had a conversation with a friend and colleague of mine, but I make it now again. As a publicly funded scholar that is actually paid by tax, taxpayers' money at the end of the day, I really do see it as my as part of my job description to not only teach but also to make suggestions for positive law and policy change uh, in, in the country that I'm working in, and that actually pays me based on the research that we're doing, based on the research that we are doing, but also based on research that other colleagues are doing that is useful for us. We don't easily, especially these days, import stuff from especially the US, I suppose, but we do import if it uh, is useful for us, I suppose, and we have come to the conclusion that on balance, fair use is something that could work for us. Um, very well. We have made many suggestions over the years, and it happens that if you actually look at the latest version of the bill, many of these uh, things that you find in the bill are very nicely aligned with the suggestions that we have made over the year. Perhaps this is the one thing where I want to go into a little bit more detail. I think what you could actually see in the current set of copyright exceptions and limitations is that what we are following now is not actually kind of a clean or pure uh, fair use approach. I think people have realized that there is this concern, or my, I have, all my guys realized that there is a concern that perhaps fair use as such um, comes at a cost of legal uncertainty that, uh, that needs to somehow be addressed as a concern. And what we now have is a very, very nice hybrid approach, I must say, which basically puts puts uh, fair use, that flexible future-proof provision at, at the center of it, but it is accompanied by a very solid, healthy set of specific exceptions and limitations that clearly spell out under what, uh, what, under what uh, conditions and circumstances you are allowed to make use of uh, permission for use of copyrighted material or not. So let me conclude. I think my time is, I haven't seen the one minute, uh, the one yet, so uh, uh, I'm negotiating here, yeah, but it's a task already. So I guess just to reiterate what I said earlier, much of, much of the criticism that you have heard, especially over the last weekend or so, is really not that well substantiated. Um, more importantly, I think what you need to look at is who, what, uh, where it is coming from, and, uh, and, um, and it just needs to be 
basically seen for what it is, lobbying and self-interest, preservation of market power, hanging on to outdated business models, and these kind of things. So let me uh, just uh, basically reiterate that um, one, there is many things in the bill that, uh, that are being tackled. We are focusing here on the exceptions and limitations today. today. They're used in, uh, in, in particular, and I do really do think that, um, that the way that the lawmaker has, um, has, has struck, reordered, restructured much more uh, understandable, comprehensible. I mean, it is no longer that kind of, you have to page five, five, five pages further to, to find the applicable exception and limitation. I think that is very commendable. This hybrid approach seems to, to work very well. And, um, especially, and this has been mentioned, and it's worth reiterating here to, to wrap up with. Um, fair use while well being flexible and in many ways future proof is of course not without limits. It really starts to irk me and not a lot of things do irk me a lot or irritate me a lot. And like this, uh, this Google uh, advertisement I found extremely really funny <laughs> instead of anything else. And if it told me anything that it was that they needed better graphic designer. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, um, so so I, I can't attach myself, but really, what really starts to irk me a little is how stubbornly some people are ignoring um, the limits of fair use, um, and uh, to be honest, it makes me wonder whether these critics either don't understand fair use, which is okay, but uh, then don't press the same point all the time, or whether they just really don't get it, and I mean, um, you choose what, what would be better. So I'm summing up here, I, I, I had planned to, to, uh, to wrap up with a couple of points here still, but I think we need that for the discussions. I'm um, looking forward to your questions comments, but also I know that there is a lot of knowledgeable people here in the audience, so we can actually, I would rather see a conversation happening than us sitting here as the panelists uh, trying to, to give legal advice on, on a certain issue. Um, but uh, this, is, this is about the, the uh, NCO uh, bill before the NCOP that hopefully will pass tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I've got, so as you know, we're live streaming this, and we've got a few questions coming from the internet. And since they don't have a chance to physically stand up and ask, I'm going to have to ask on their behalf. I've got one question which I want to start off with. Um, what about open media like openculture.com? What happens um, to people who want to use elements from someone else's work? Did someone create a derivative work if the original author rejects approval? And I suppose uh, I want to add on to that question. Uh, what would be the difference in approach to dealing with this issue from a fair dealing point of view, which is what we currently have in South Africa, to a fair use point of view, which is what the bill wants to introduce? Thanks. Um, can other panelists, do you mind please coming forward to, to join the conversation just to make it a little bit easier? Yeah, yes, you can, yeah. But I can do some questions. Did you guys catch that question? is no, under, ni under either fair dealing or fair use, you may not freely create a derivative work from another work. In order for your use of another work to constitute a fair use or a fair dealing, you must have transformed it in some way so it doesn't um, compete in the same market. And that term derivative work basically is a legal term which means it really is kind of taking from that original work and it, and it is not a wholly different work that transforms it in some way. So derivative works in both the US and South Africa um, by that legal definition would infringe. Um, what fair use gives you is the right to make a truly transformative work. So if you're making um, a mashup, for instance, you know, sampling a lot of different works but creating something completely different that doesn't exist in the same market as the original, 
then that could be lawful under both fair use and fair dealing. And the difference in the analysis is does, does the use fit into the categories described in fair dealing already? And if not, then you can't do it. So for instance, the, the current fair dealing right has no purpose to entertain. So if, you're, if your mashup was criticizing the original work, then you could do it under fair dealing. If you were just merely trying to entertain by creating some kind of mashup or something, it wouldn't fall into fair dealing, but it could fall into fair use because fair use doesn't limit you to criticizing the other work. So making a, a completely new standalone entertaining work that mashes up some other kind of originals um, could qualify as fair use. I'm also going to ask if I can, I can expand on that answer a bit as well. Um, it also depends on the, um, sorry for those who are uh, live streaming this, it's <laughs> Douglas from Wikimedia South Africa here. It also depends on the uh, copyright license under which the author of the original work chooses to issue their work. So if it's all rights reviewed, absolutely all of this stuff applies. If they choose to release it, like Wikipedia is based on a lot of Creative Commons works, if they choose to release it under Creative Commons license, depending on the exact nature of the license, then yes, um, regardless of whether you've got a fair dealing or fair use system, people can reuse it and remash that work. Um, the, and, and, that's, and that's because the author of the work chose to release that work to the public under that license. Please set your name and what organization you're from or brief background for the purpose of the people that live streaming. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Ornat. Um, I'm an activist. Um, I'm an artist um, and I'm also a development practitioner. I've um, been working with the KTSA for the past year and a half or so. Um, and I've been following the copyrights bill um, for the creative for the past year at least. Um, my issue though is how we make this bill or even policy creation or making um, famous, as South Africa would say. Um, I know that a lot of activists will choose to march or stand in the bridges more than go to parliament and follow the policy formulation. What do we think is the cause for that? In, in, in our um, in, 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 in our audience today, um, we've got uh, two right to know activists. We also two have two SACO uh, members coming from Monabisi Park, which is a very informal settlement in Kaicha. Um, so, Maybe because the language that we use to explain issues, especially policy, is not conducive for the normal human being. And maybe also it is because as an artist sitting in Kaili Chat in Monobisi Park, I don't even understand what you are saying. I don't even understand what it means to me. So, can we make it simpler for everyone to understand exactly what we mean and exactly why is this important in my life? Um, and I think the second question then that I would have and add as a comment is why do we think that activism campaigns like your right to go with social justice and qualification are not necessarily following this particular bill? What is the cause? Because we know that they can make a lot of noise. Um, and how much effort are we putting into that to make sure that the activist campaign understand exactly what is going on? Thanks. Um, Tuti, do you think you could answer that question? Right, thanks. Um, thanks, Nancy. I think you, you raised some very um, important um, issues around 
access to the public processes that are taking place and also perhaps a role for um, recreate or institutions that are at that nexus kind of between policy and research to do more training and, and awareness raising. Um, I don't think it's been to, uh, due to a lack of effort, I think, on the part of recreate. I think, um, you know, the meetings are, are public. Everybody is, is free and welcome to, to attend. I think the same would go for the parliamentary processes. Um, the bill has been widely publicized and every member of the public is, is welcome to, to input. I think perhaps um, what we could have done better, unlike the Performance Protection Amendment Bill, where I think you've seen you know, famous actors, actresses, um, tweeting about um, you know, the implication that the bull is going to have on their profession and calling upon their fellow members or supporters or fans to write even one line to the portfolio committee to say, I support the bull. Um, so I mean, that's been an interesting process to, to watch. I think perhaps issues of copyright aren't as sexy or aren't seen to be as sexy and as topical um, as you know issues that would affect actors. And I think as someone mentioned that it is a, it is a very complex piece of um, legislation and uh, perhaps there is more to do to, to simplify it and popularize it for you know, ordinary people. Just adding to this, we have Pazin, because you were looking at me when you were talking about it. <laughs> 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 it was, was framed in such a complicated question, so I really tried to, to, to make it as easily understandable as I, I can. I think it can even be uh, um, uh, uh, communicated even more complicated. But I, but I take this to heart what you're saying, obviously, and it's actually a thing that we ask ourselves all the time how do we better bridge that disconnect oftentimes between academia? And civil so society and, and and grassroots stakeholders. There's different. We, we try to do that. Not every academic wants to wants to play that game, but those academics that actually want to play in that field, um, putting a lot of effort to uh, to repackage uh, what they are uh, producing because it is important that you that you use a different language to do that instead of going to someone and say, listen, okay, what do you want to talk about copyright a little bit? Guess what? I have a 300 page book that uh, you may want to write. <laughs> you normally lose that conversation very quickly, but if you have a two pager or something where you basically summarize with uh, some of the key findings in an easy, accessible language, then, then that makes, uh, uh, makes, makes, makes a big difference. But I think there's two things that I want to, want to finish off with in, uh, in my answering your, your question. I think the first thing is what we just heard and what you also hinted on. We need to link what copyright discussion is all about to real world problems. So it's not a discussion of what copyright it is a discussion, and that's why the panels look like they look today. It is a discussion about the price of uh, access to um, education material, the, the struggles of students to, uh, to, to, to buy the textbooks that are being prescribed and so forth. And, and I think we're, we're, we're trying uh, uh, we're trying this. Um, I think I wanted to say something else, but, but I forgot what that is now. So. <laughs> All right. Um, to go, yeah. Um, I just wanted to just want to bring quickly on on on, on, on Unati's question. Um, first of all, we we live within communities that are very over politicized, right? And what do I mean by that? We have like a very significant alliance on political parties, you know, or political formations of any sort, you know. So now that kind of um, distorts at some point or, or sort of um, mixes up the message or mixes up um, the intention of what is trying to get achieved. Um, just talking from the very broad perspective, which sort of permeates to what we're talking about today, tonight, right? So now if you have um, a situation whereby um, a lot of people would look up to a certain politi uh, political party which is um, dominating um, a certain community, then you will have problems in having um, to address these issues in a language that can be heard by almost everyone in every community because um, political parties obviously will use um, those issues for either engineering or or to gain political um, points and things like that. You know what I'm saying? Then also, I want to, to, to add by saying, you see, the issue of decolonization is, 
it's an issue of language for starters. It's it's an issue of language and lived experience from my view. You know what I'm saying? Because some of the things that we study or, or discover or rediscover at university or college level, you find out that it's some of the things that you, you have known all along. You know, and there, there, there's obviously um, a huge amount of scholarly literature to, 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 to attest or to solidify that, that, that statement. So now, which means that um, if we can use, um, I don't want to overuse the word decolonization, but what matters is that if we use our lived experience as a springbok to reimagine a uh, decolonized Africa, then we will be having um, a very clear platform within which we can start any discussions about these kinds of ideas and any other new ideas. My name is Thelma Fapp. I work in the film industry. Um, if somebody could please just speak to Section 2A, where it states, uh, it clarifies the copyright changes will clarify the copyright does not protect ideas. I'm speaking specifically um, to screenplays and scripts. Um, so it is and has always been a basic principle of copyright laws in South Africa and all the world, all around the world, um, that uh, we follow what is called, um, sorry for that <laughs> language, but it's called the idea expression dichotomy. So what that essentially means is that as long as ideas are not materialized into some form of material form, they are actually not copyright protected. That is so now, and the bill is not law change that. It is a problem and there is ways around that um, to protect your ideas, so to speak, but you need to find a way to basically write it down in one way or the other. I always tell, I mean, this is an old-fashioned, not very technical kind of approach, but what I always tell people is write this idea down, put it into an envelope, send it to yourself as a by registered mail, and uh, then you actually don't open it, and you have then proof that on a certain day you, you had that you had uh, come up with this idea. But it's really just that expression of the idea that is being protected. If someone sees that idea and based on that idea envisions that differently and materializes in a different form, then again you would find uh, difficulties to 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 have an infringement. To enforce it. So if I understand correctly, copyright law as it exists, yes, if you have a uh, mailed copy dated that predates anybody else's work that is similar, then it is that is your literary copyright. Correct to extend the published book. That, in that expression of that idea. So you actually don't protect the idea, protect the expression exactly. of that idea. Okay. And it, that it is a little technical, but it is just it's 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 also one of the things that blows the mind of the students that I that I do the copyright 101 session normally in lecture one. No formalities, that's the first time what blows people's minds, that it actually comes into being automatically. All the stuff that you created here, and you just took notes, everything is automatically copyright protected. That's the first light bulb moment in people. And the second one is that ideas actually um, are free, um, only the expressions uh, of those ideas um, receive uh, protection on the copyright laws. Only expressions of the ideas. Yes. Hi, Monica from West Coast. Just curious, do all of you think this is a well crafted bill? I think none of us can argue with the fair use issues. I think it was well argued, well done, but it bedded in the bill, and it is conjoined with the two bills. We have a problem that there are issues here that create uncertainty for investors, for research, and is this something that is implementable? So I think. You know, we have a lot of very scared investors. We need to talk about the fact that contract law is not well defined in the new legislation as proposed. I think I want to pass this on to someone. Chair? to contracts in, in the law, uh, there's a lot of concern that the contract uh, becomes unenforceable uh, for various reasons. And I think um, what has been happening for years is that, particularly in the educational sector, publishers have been giving us 
agreements to sign that override the, the lawful exceptions we have. So we are paying uh, copyright fees to go and copy that material when we essentially should be able to do it. And this bill allows that not to happen. So if a, 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 a contract overrides anything that is lawful in, that, uh, in the exceptions, it becomes unenforceable. And that's not just copyright. If, uh, if you have a law that tells you that it's legal to go through a green robot, but you have a contract that says you can't, that is unenforceable because you're overriding a lawful exception or a law. A law. Um, so I think the law clarifies that. Um, and I'm not sure why anyone would be worried that the contracts might um, go out the window. It actually clarifies that if you're putting illegal uh, provisions in the law, it won't work. It's not a contract that you can sign because you're overriding lawful information. And I'm just uh, maybe going off the point here, but I also want to talk about contracts with um, publishers and authors. Um, I do a lot of education for <coughs> research and methodology at Wits University and at other universities on the quest. And authors don't know they have rights. Um, I stress to them <clears throat> that do you know you have rights? Do you know that you don't have to sign over a contract to a publisher? Do you know that you can retain rights? Do you know that a lot of publishers give you back your rights now, particularly on open access? But if you negotiate, they will give you something back. Um, we have a bit uh, as an author's agenda, which we encourage these uh, authors to attach because they get awful contracts. The uh, royalty fees are new and hopeless. They can't really live on them. And they really have terrible agreements. And now we're encouraging our authors to say, hey, I would like some back. I'd like to be able to put something on my personal blog. I'd like to share it in my colleague, with my research colleagues. I'd like to share it in teaching. It's my paper. I would like to do that. So I think there's a lot of issues around contracts. Um, that um, the new bill actually clarifies. Um, particularly, there's a lot of complaints about the um, assignment going back after 25 years. Most textbooks are only, available, uh, only um, worth looking at for two or three years, and then you get a new edition. Sometimes they're even a new edition every year. So what are you worrying about? Um, the new copyright comes in uh, relating to the new work. And why would people be reading textbooks 10 years old if they can get today's edition? Um, so these issues, I think a lot of authors don't realize. They've been pushed into agreements where they hand over all their copyright. And if you want to go and translate your own work, it's happened to me, um, where it's want to be translated into another country's law, or I want to do an abridged version, or I want to do a chapter book. On the same paper, I had to go back four times to ask the publisher for permission to do something that was my work. So I think the bill clarifies a lot that authors do have rights and that publishers on our hand can have to share it. Um, and I think that the collection society is also worried because they now also have to pay authors and will be regulated. So they'll have to be fair, which they are not being fair at the moment. Thank you, Aaron. I wasn't actually going to speak but I'm speaking partly out of anger at the way the publishing industry has behaved with this legislation, and partly also in response to your comments on colonization. So I'm going to tell you a short story from the perspective of my age. Um, in the 1990s, I was at Bits Press, and I was in the publishing industry, and I was the chair of the Copyright Committee, and I was for a number of years. And in that period, we were talking to the Norwegians, and the reason, reason we were talking to the Norwegians about how to structure copyright and permission and licensing was the Norwegian system gives the power to the creators. So the Norwegian Collecting Society is a committee of all the kinds of authors can make, that can make up the field of working. And so it was very democratic. They were all on the board. Then Ara, Ara grew up in the publishing industry and I left Vince Press as well. And before you knew what had happened, the new chair of the Copyright Committee ran to the British. Makes your point, doesn't it? So what we got instead was a British system that gives all power to the publisher. And I think that's what we've lived with ever since. And that's why I really like the way this legislation was put together. It was deeply consultative. It was carefully thought out. I've never ever seen the Department of Trade and Industry, and you can see I'm quite old. I've never seen them engage with policy making in this way. 
the director used to come to a meeting at 8 o'clock and we'd start talking policy and legal reform and he'd leave at night. They said, for how long this time? 10 hours talking about policy. So I think what we've got potentially in the new legislation is a way of moving away from that colonized model of empowering all the people who are involved in the process of producing um, creative works. And so I applaud what's happening and prepared to be very pleased that after all these years, something has moved on and is looking actually pretty good, even if it's not perfect. Thank you. Great, thank you. I just uh, I watched the, the lady Monica, I believe, that, uh, that made the previous interventions, and so I thought I, I want to add to this Westboro, right? Uh, is, that, is that what you're working for? Okay. Um, so, um, just in, in, in answering the question, is it implementable is, and is it well crafted? Um, the answer to that is yes and um, uh, now yes. Um, so I think what has gotten kind of uh, lost in, in the communication over the years is that what, when people still talk about the bill, they go way back and look at what was essentially the first version of the bill, which needed significant improvement and has changed and improved significantly. So I think it's un almost unfair if uh, it, that this kind of criticism what, that was per perhaps justifiably uh, raised against uh, earlier iterations of the bill just continues to linger without oftentimes a feel real um, engagement with the changes. Um, I, 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 I um, was able to, um, to, to see some of the work and the kind of work that went into, uh, into the fixing of the bill and the drafting and redrafting of the bill. Very experienced drafters, legislative drafters that, uh, that, that work for, for, for weeks and weeks on the basis of exo sheets where they had all the stakeholder comments. So it, it was a real deep engagement with the stakeholders as, uh, as Eve Gray just mentioned that I saw there, also you shook your head. Yeah. It was deeply consultative. I'm not aware of any piece of, cons uh, of, of legislation that in a period of, of literally more than a decade had so many opportunities for public input. Yes, man, some of us may have missed these opportunities, but this is nothing that you can blame the, um, um, uh, the, the lawmaker for. Certainly the invitation to contribute was there, and we have perhaps not fully done this, but a lot of people also. Have done it. And then lastly, and I think that might actually be the most interesting point in the last minute or so that, that, that I was speaking, I'm intrigued by this argument that um, IP regimes, uh, or the causality between IP regimes on the one side and foreign direct investment on the other side. I have done research on that. I've started to actually ask some of my PhD students and others to look more into this. And uh, while we are still busy doing this, I can tell you that uh, certainly uh, based on on some of the research um, on this topic globally, but also the very few people that have written on the connect between uh, these two in the African context, this is usually overstated. There is so many other factors, some other factors that particularly work also well because of efforts that, that Westboro is doing, like infrastructure, like the education of the people, which is again one of the, uh, the emphasis of, of the bill to increase that, right? Um, this plays a huge role. Um, a number of other factors. Yes, IP is one. But I think even if you acknowledge that there is a connect between IP and foreign direct investment, I think you cannot say that this is um, uh, um, kind of um, on balance. Uh, it's, uh, it's negative for foreign direct investors because I think there is a lot of positives for we heard that there is for for some of us, for, for some creators what is proposed in the bill will be extra and extra incentive compared to what we have now and also I think we should not overstate that relationship I'm very happy to have a follow-up conversation because it really does intrigue me but I think I want to take your fear a little bit away because I saw you got quite <laughs> agitated uh, over the last minute or so. I also wanted to just say that um, the consultation was wide and long. It was almost uh, almost four years that we've had chances over and over. In fact, people got quite sick. Why is there another call for submissions? Even on a few clauses, we were given the opportunity to uh, comment. Um, so we've had many times uh, where we could actually. Um, get information. And then at the uh, public hearings of the Portfolio Committee, we were invited after present presenting in Parliament, they asked us to send them additional information if it was relevant. Um, 
that a lot of uh, rights owners have complained that they've put in recommendations and they haven't been heard at all, they've been ignored. Well, would you address someone who starts in Parliament saying, I'm going to be strong about this and I'm going to use strong language because this is a rubbish book and it, it was written by kindergartens and he trashed the bill completely in Parliament, publicly. International people can watch you. Um, would you listen to someone who did that? If someone gave you a constructive criticism saying, this is not right, but fix it this way, wouldn't they listen? So perhaps the way they've treated the DTI is one way by they're being ignored. Secondly, they were involved. In fact, the tech team, the last tech team, were all rights owners, people from the Copyright Alliance, working on the bill. They were the people who had the final alignment with the policy of, and the policy and the construct, I mean, the constitution. So they were writing the bill right at the end. They were the ones who finalised the bill, version 5. And then regulations are coming. We won't just get this bill and that's it. We can't really do anything before the regulations are written. And they will clarify some of these concerns as to how you can do things, when you can do them, when you can't do them. So that is something that's coming in the future. It's been, they obviously being drafted at the moment, but we can't just accept that tomorrow it's going to be granted, it will be voted and it will be enacted. We will have regulations to regulate and implement the law. So they are, it will clarify some of the things that we're not uh, you know, worried about, that people are concerned about. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my question is for Toby. Uh, my name is Alistair. I have been working on creating a television program for like three years now. And um, it's a real world problem that I've got. I'm, I'm going to approach a potential investor over the weekend. And my fear is that the person can steal my idea. So I think you've touched a bit on it when the other lady asked and you spoke about the registered mail story. And I just need clarity on that. Would that um, suffice for a, a, an audio visual thing? And um, also, what if somebody had that idea before and did the whole registered mail thing? Then what, who will have um, authority over the other? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, I uh, think there's legal advice in there. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> It's so easy to get out of these situations. Under German law, when I was practicing in Germany, it's actually not allowed to give free legal advice. So I could always <laughs> say, you know what, it's not allowed under the law. So yes, but, uh, but on a more serious note, again, there's an invitation to have a follow-up conversation on this. You already heard that there isn't ways and means to, uh, practically, um, but perhaps not what you feel legally to protect uh, what you currently have as an, an idea in your mind for a TV program. In fact, I can remember that one of my colleagues made me a problem with assignment of for one of those you know, classes of LRP students. I will also have a conversation with her about this. But it essentially, um, um, uh, the gist of it is, is, is clear to you. I think you would, um, there's, um, there's other um, legal means that can assist you. There's, uh, um, there's uh, non-disclosure agreements that you can sign. You can make your partner on the other side sign something that basically tells the world afterwards that you told the person that and that the person promised you not to use that for a TV program or something. So I think we are moving more into the contractual area that, um, uh, than, uh, than, the, than, than, than the core area of intellectual property. But we have other um, IP scholars here on the panel, um, so I'm happy to also open this, this up if, if they have other ideas, but uh, also we can have a one-on-one. -on -one. It is a difficult uh, thing to do, um, but it is, uh, you can minimize your risk, not completely go away. And I wish you luck with your TV program at the end of <laughs> People are reluctant to sign NDAs, even if they sign NDAs, the question earlier was about enforcement. Sure. We as creative artists, what capacity do we have to enforce? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you now, I pitched a TV series, the idea was stolen, it was pitched in LA, it was produced in South Africa. Sure. It, it's it's no credit to me. So you can have somebody sign an NDA, they can listen to your pitch, and then they can go and get funding and produce your show, and it's incumbent on you to prosecute them. 
Yeah. It's not a weakness of just because for the purpose of today, it's not a weakness of the current build bit. This is not protected. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's perhaps a weakness of the system yeah, that we need to talk about. Yes, and how do you litigate against somebody who takes your idea? Yeah, that's true. Uh, the bill is the bill now. It's about fair use. So who's going to ensure what fair use? Please remember to speak to the microphone. Uh, uh, All right. I'm I'm Gabby Larue, music producer, South African music industry for uh, 42 years. I do many other things, uh, but for my sins at the age of 63, I'm also very strong South African music economy activist. Um, I'm probably known to some here in the room for being one of the most outspoken activists against the bill in its current form. So I would like to be very, very short for the benefit of everybody, but I need to start off with the duty, a moral duty that I believe I have to issue an apology to Dr. Klein for understating her, her position and her creative and academic prowess I'm the one who, who put together, so it's a he, it's a he. And secondly, I did consult Google, and I must say, in this particular instance, Google was not informative enough. So my, my reference to you as a bit academic was simply from the information that was available to me, but my humblest and unconditional apologies to you. Apology accepted. Thank you. <laughs> right. Now may I start? So, there are many, many things that we feel are incomplete in, in the bill. Um, many of us who are opposing the bill are not suggesting that we should scrap the bill and turn from start from scratch. I think the bill has come a long way in addressing some of the issues that really needed to be addressed uh, from the bill that was, that was issued in 1978. We seriously needed amendment. What some of us have issue with is firstly that many of the directives I come from the music industry, also I want to make that clear. The, the literary work industry, that's really not what I do apart from being a lyricist. What I want to say about that is just the issue about being able to copy just a portion of a work uh, and making that okay, you're not copying the entire work. I'm a musician, so if you write a piece of music, that would be, that would be in a sense say, look, you can have the chorus, <laughs> which is really the hook of the song. If you're going to make a ringtone, you would only use the chorus. That's the meat of the meal. If you translate it into terms of a meal and you put the meal on the table, it's, it's almost as if you're saying, you can have the meat as long as you don't have the whole plate of food. You know, It's really the meat that you would be after. Is that not a, a matter of cherry picking? I would, I would, I would like perhaps you know, Flynn to respond to that particular one. The other one is that if you look at, at the European Parliament, there's a parallel process at the moment going on where they're also looking at they've been looking at their copyright legislation and is a huge, particularly the two clauses, Article 13 and Article 11, where issues like the value gap has been very, very much under, under the microscope. Now, I want to point out, I'm not sure how many musicians there are here, but that's really what I represent. And, and I'm just trying to make a point, and I really would, would want to hear your response. The value gap really based on the original legislation in the US that wanted to make sure that there wouldn't be a myriad of lawsuits just because there's an internet. And I can understand the logic originally in 1998 for that bill being promulgated, but the way it has manifested now makes it possible for anyone to post anyone's work on a YouTube, for instance. And unless a person like myself or whoever composes work is involved, sits there and spends hours a day searching searching for an infringement on their copyright. That work, in my case, it actually happened, where the, the, perhaps my biggest track, the Color Culture by Mendoza, was posted by someone I think, five, six years ago. And I only realized it maybe four or five years later. And it's been heavily populated by advertising. And all of that advertising revenue went to YouTube. And if, when I looked at my returns from that post, firstly, we couldn't trace the person who originally posted it, and secondly, I, I couldn't get any revenue from that. So that's just a simple example. So that's the other issue. Our bill doesn't address the value gap, the impact of the value gap. That's the other thing. Lastly, and I've got many more, but I don't want to hold this mic. I'll just leave it at this. 
if this bill is incomplete, and this is the context, I would like from the panelists to find out, do you believe that this bill in its current draft, which is draft five, I believe, with all the things that have been deleted along the line, where people have issue with that, and all the things that people feel have not been addressed adequately, and also in answering the directives of the, of the MIT two report and the CRC report, which originated the amendment of these two bills, if all of those directives have not at least been heavily debated and either either addressed or addressed in a half baked manner, is this board really ready, you know, for the president to sign it off with? Do, do the panelists all believe that the bill in its current draft is ready to go into into effect? I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm happy to engage your question and a couple of things you say, but honestly, I think you owe everybody on this panel an apology for your ridiculous poster. It, it really shows the level of the debate of kind of actually avoiding the substance and just painting literally the name Google on it. So no one here actually represents Google. It is true that the tech industry has interests in the bill, but honestly, you don't see full page ads being taken up by the tech industry. This isn't core to what they're really interested in in South Africa. So to your point, um, fair use does not give anyone in the United States, and it wouldn't give anyone here, the right to copy the chorus of the music and put it on a ringtone. That's not a fair use. Fair use doesn't mean that every single excerpt is automatically free. What I was pointing at is the fallacy that's been talked about that the bill authorizes the copying of fireworks for educational uses. And it shows the level of just non-reading that goes on on the other side. Because if you read the bill, the educational right must be for the purpose of education and must be an excerpt. So it doesn't allow the copies of the entire works. But it doesn't allow commercial uses of those excerpts at all. So if you're commercially using a song or part of a song and displacing the legitimate market of the author, then it's not a fair use. So fair use doesn't threaten what you think you're threatened on by fair use. I don't agree with your first statement that the objective of the people opposing the bill, which you appear to be one, is not to kill the entire bill. It clearly is. It clearly is to try to not have this bill passed in this period or in its present form. And I think that actually does a disservice to creators. So we've been focusing on the reasonability of the limitations and exceptions in the bill, which I think are well-drafted and are very reasonable. But here's the other things that the bill does that are on the author's right side. It recognizes for the first time ever a right of communication, which is key for musicians to be compensated for the making available of works, for instance, on the internet. It recognizes performers' rights which is key to actually compensating not just the producers of, of the script, but the actual performers of the music. It authorizes the protection of, of technical protection measures to lock works and make sure that they're not copied for a purpose that would prohibit, uh, be prohibited by copyright itself. It has an author reversion right, so with an author being a musician or others, you know, Prince is a famous example, signs a low value contract early on, and then by the time 25 years pass, that's an extremely high value good, that right comes back to the author. That favors musicians in compared to publishers. So this is why we see a lot of, of angst by publishers, because the bill favors creators. It creates a new commission and a tribunal which will lower the cost of enforcement. So you don't have to go to a court now, you can go to a more easy to access institution. It has um, rights for the creator instead of the commissioner for commissioned works. So somebody pays you to write a song and if the contract is, is silent right now under the current act, the commissioner already automatically owns all your rights. This is very common, I know, in the film industry in this country. I've done a lot of work with documentary filmmakers. Almost all their work is commissioned by the SABC or some other station. And the filmmakers don't alter those contracts 
or the contracts are silent, and so they think they own their work and can create uh, derivative works, or they can take their work into film festivals, and the answer is they can't, because SABC owns all their rights. That would change under the current bill. The bill regulates collective management organizations, which you and the music industry should be very happy about, because it's one of the industries where creatives are the most objectified. Royalties are collected, especially for music, all around this country and frankly in other, every country and are not paid out because there's no regulation requiring that they actually pay out a certain percentage of those. And you know what the money is being used on in this country is taking out full page ads opposing this bill and trying to convince people like you that you should be opposed for it when really they should be for it. Not the CMOs should be for it, but the artists who should own the CMOs should be for it. It creates royalty sharing agreements, so no longer can uh, publishers simply require an assignment of their contract over and then not pay royalties to the author or creator when additional value is created over time. And it creates uh, resale rights for artists. So again, the, the instance when artists sell their work at a very low price and the value increases over time, it actually gives the ability of artists to come in on that. And those are all real value gap issues. So the value gap issue you say about uh, EU Article uh, 13 is about creating liability for any kind of intermediary for any copyright content that goes over their system. And that is a crazy rule. And that's why uh, organizations like Wikipedia and schools and universities are up in arms because we are all intermediaries. You create a strict liability system which has been posed for years and some people really like that idea, but you will shut down what happens over the years. So I'm not for Article 13. I actually am for a lot of these rights, but when we oppose the bill, all of these rights go away. All of the increases of creator rights, as well as the increases of limitations and exceptions that as well help creators, including musicians. So I think you should get rid of your silly poster, read the bill, and learn about how your interests are actually promoted by the film. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, let's not keep you guys here all night. Uh, we'll take three more questions from the floor. The panelists aren't running away. One more question from the, the live stream. Oh, one more question. Oh. <laughs> okay. There's only three more questions that have raised their hands. Can we try, can we try to be brief so we don't keep you here all night? We do have refreshments afterwards. We don't want to starve you. <laughs> Um, my name is Ross Miller. Um, most of the questions that I want to go ask is already been addressed by the former today and the young guy at the left over here. Um, I just want to know when this bill does get passed, how would it affect written screenplays that are already registered by the Rights of South Africa, as well as TV series pictures and feature films? Can someone use fair use and create a twin project on their backs? Thank you. No. <laughs> no. It's not fair use. It's privacy inside of it. Sorry. No, it's not fair use. If, if someone basically steals your idea and creates a twin project, that's known as piracy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening. My name is Sandy Sotwala from Kailita in an informal settlement called Monobisipa. Uh, Mr. Flay, this question comes directly to you. Uh, as I proposed what is written here, I'd like to be clarified to uh, the difference between um, artist lives, financial, political, between South Africa and where you come from in terms of uh, fair dealing and fair use. Sorry, I missed that. So the, what the, the answer is, what's the, the difference between fair use and fair dealing? Artist lives, financial and political, between South Africa and USA. Thank you. Do you want to take a couple? 
You can take a couple of questions and we can answer them. Hi, uh, good evening. Um, I'm Patina Ndobo and I'm in Dr. Tobias's class. Okay, so I just have two questions, no, one question and then just one comment. Um, the comment I want to make is in regards to the people who are totally against the amendment bill. I was one of them last week and then I figured it out, I read between the lines. And how I read in between the lines is the law of physics, which is the pendulum theory, right? You have two opposing forces in two separate ends, and the middle ground would be the exceptions and limitations of the law, per se, and it's the interests of the copyright owners and the consumers. If the copyright owners hold the pendulum far back, that is, clip, demand, an act that is overstrenuous, that is too demanding, that is just impractical, impractical in the current era that we're in right now. Hello, okay. <laughs> if they demand something so heavy, ultimately, when the pendulum swings back, it doesn't swing back at a third, it swings the exact arc it took to go that way, it's the exact arc it takes to go that way. So if the Copyright Act currently is kept in place, you cannot sit and be cool and assume that um, there no, there's no leeway or no corner or some way that people are going to find ways to access your information. Even if it's not legally, they will access it better now when there's a Copyright Amendment Bill that's actually taking into consideration your needs and it's like a round table, everybody's interests are being taken account of. But if we do it illegally, it's a lose-lose situation for the copyright holder. And with that in mind, I'm just moving to the etymology or the justifications of when you're making a law, right? You have to think of why are we doing this? People often think of an action and a consequence, but they never think of the meaning, the middle ground, right? That's why you have like repeated offenders, they go to jail, they just know killing is wrong, they don't know why it's wrong, you understand? So if people don't understand the why of the copyright amendment bill, there will be drawbacks continuously, etc. But I believe if you hold the pendulum that back, you continue to keep Africa, this is from political, from my understanding, if the pendulum is held to the far extreme, Africa continues to be dependent on foreign aid and we continue to be a burden to the foreign community and we are retarding globalization because we don't have access to information. And the information we're accessing is information from the US. I found an article about South African perspective from the US because I can't access it from the South African textbooks, right? And we're promoting foreign I don't know if I don't think that word is appropriate, but we're promoting foreign writers while discarding our own. So I think I've spoken too much. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, you said uh, they, 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 you took like three years to subscribe or whatever, you really don't know. But what about a uh, person from the villages in this case? She, he, he, she or he doesn't know, it's worth our way, and it's worth if you are in the country, but we don't have access on, on the internet or wifi or whatever. It is still the same, the neoliberal act that I'm seeing of this bill is still going to kill us. I'm not going to wrong that you know. And uh, it's not there to uplift our living. Yeah, it's not a of us. Um, for the I'm so sorry, I'm so hard. Because the way I see it, because the bill is like processed, you know? we didn't have any voice. If we did the voice, so that was there for the academics and those who know whatever, not for the one from the grassroots level. Thank you. Last coming for the night before you just wrap things up. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm not going to address, I think, all of the questions. Just um, perhaps just to agree with a lot of what um, Eve, um, you know, had to say about the process and, and where we are, and hopefully.
it will result in a more balanced copyright regime in South Africa. Um, Gary's question around, is the bill ready? Um, I think as a policy analyst, the bill attempts to address a lot of the issues, a lot of our kind of social, some political, some technical issues. Um, and as a result, you'll find that some authors are happy, some authors are not happy. Some musicians are happy, some musicians are not happy. It's the same with filmmakers. It's the same with basically every kind of creative, you know, subsector that you engage with, depending on how they understand the bill and depending on what they see as the benefits that are in the bill for them or what the potential costs in the bill for them are. Um, so is the bill is the bill ready? Um, I think it attempts to address some issues that perhaps fall slightly outside of you know the copyright um, act, and hopefully with the regulations coming up, there'll be greater clarity in terms of how the actual bill is going to to operate going forward. Um, and then just uh, Patilla's I think comment that that she made I think was a very good way of kind of looking at where we are when we go from the kind of one extreme of, of absolute kind of copyright um, protection and the middle ground being the kind of general and specific exceptions. Um, and I think that's where the fair use sort of principles now are a little bit handier than what we had at the fair dealing in that they provide guidelines and if you look at the four factor kind of test, it does give you some sort of handrails around what is acceptable and not acceptable in terms of constitution, constitution itself as, as fair use. Great, thank you. Thanks everybody for staying so that I can also smell food. <laughs> um, just also picking up selectively on a, on a few things that were mentioned. First, um, yes, the bill is ready. The bill is as ready as it can be. It's not perfect. Nobody actually claims it's perfect, but it's as, as uh, I think it is ready to to be signed by the president, and, and especially so because I think any further delay really is costly. It does cost people to not see the changes that are being proposed. Nothing uh, prevents us in the future to, um, to tackling any of the outstanding days. Also, there might be outstanding issues. Uh, I don't think, uh, I'm, I'm certainly in agreement with, uh, with Sean on, on, uh, on, uh, on what's going on in the European Union, but it's also good to perhaps just see what's happening and not just jump forward and say, we're not going to do exactly what they are doing, but first see what kind of experience that they are making. The first kind of experience that they are making is that they are getting huge public pushback to, to that, and there's thousands of people, hundreds and thousands of people actually demonstrating against these provisions and the laws, something that we very see very, very rarely in the area of intellectual property. So I think um, that, that certainly is an area we'd rather wait and, uh, and see, and I think we should wait rather long uh, before we do something similar to what's happening in Europe, but generally, just by uh, by, by getting the bill through, um, it's, it's, uh, that, is, that is by no means uh, uh, like closing the issue um, and, and precludes us from doing something in the future. So Bettina's point was also very well taken. I think the only comment to, that I would like to make is that what I could hear in there is still, and I think this is actually an important point to raise for the discussion generally, for the framing of the discussion, is that there is still this kind of I use the word now again, the dichotomy between on the one hand there is the producer or the creator of content and then on the other side there is the consumer. And I think we are beyond that. I think that is actually the problem that we are facing and one of the things why we, why we actually claim that the um, user-friendly provisions in the bill ultimately also benefit creators is because most of us, especially with the kind of creativity facilitated through the internet, we have all all become what is what is framed as prosumers. We all start to create, we build up on the world of others, really. No, very few people in the room really create from scratch. We all build upon what others have done. And, it's, and to, to maximize creativity, you need to have provisions in the law to kickstart the process through uh, permission and royalty. Some uh, provision and royalty free uses of other people's copyrighted work, but with the limits that the fair use provision in particular contains the four factors, uh, factors that we have already mentioned a few times. Thank you. Um, just to wrap it up, all the Would you like to say something? One more comment. Last comment. Last comment. <laughs> Okay, um, what I can just add to what has just been said tonight is that um, from my experience with um, the engagements with 
that's from Spill, was that there hasn't been um, clear communication lines between the various government departments. For instance, your science and technology speaks um, a different language, arts and culture speaks a different language, um, communications speaks a different language. And I feel that what we need, um, because I mean, the bill, as much as it, 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 it's ready to be passed, but that dialogue needs to take place be, between these ministries because at the end of the day, they do affect each other. I work on video games and video games, they have a component of science and technology because they work with computation. And they also have a, a component of art because it's music and audiovisual um, um, components to that. And then um, finally, to, to speak to the other lady um, who's from Rights to Know um, about the accessibility um, of, of, of um, these issues to people on the grassroots. I think, again, it, it, it goes back to what I was saying earlier on that um, there's too much politicization of, of, of these matters. And that on its own, it's not progressive, it's just too retrogressive because people, um, some people will say, you know, um, it's capitalist, um, therefore they are against capitalism and so on, you know. Um, the producers are too capitalist and they're exploiting the others, but they haven't looked at progressive ways to, 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 to communicate their ideas across um, people from um, different ideologies and so on. But um, with this bill, I feel that there is a um, very much positive um, outcome that is envisaged. Thank you. Just going to allow um, our last three panelists to make their closing comments. Uh, so, just quickly, in response to the question that was directed at me, I, mean, I think the difference legally between artists in the U.S. and South Africa is that artists in the U.S. both have more rights. A lot of these rights that are being put in to the South Africa law now are already in the U.S. law, and they have more freedoms. So, the, under the exceptions regime and fair use in South Africa, in the United States. There's more freedom to create. There's, there's less restrictions on the ability to recreate with new works. So those are the two big differences. I think from my side, just two comments. The one is that it's easy to blame, and it's easy to say I didn't have an opportunity, and it's easy to say due to my circumstances, or due to this, or due to that but you have a responsibility to engage in the things that will influence your life. We are talking about copyright. That might not make a huge difference to the people living in Kailicha, but there are very many other bills that's currently under discussion and open for discussion that will change the lives of those people. So if you're serious, man up and take responsibility. And the second thing is no to 80% of the money that leaves this country. I just want to say that the bill allows accessibility for people who have been um, discriminated for years, the blind, the deaf, the disabled. Um, the book family is shocking. 5% of the world's publications are in an accessible format, and I think it's 1% in South Africa. This bill gives access to disabled people, and if we sign, uh, if we approve this bill, uh, we will sign the Marrakech Treaty, which will give us accessibility across borders. At the moment, um, South Africa, if, one, if South Africa wants to publish the law to freedom, they have to convert it into Braille, which takes months. And then if Botswana needs a copy, Botswana has to make a copy because we can't share it. The Marrakesh Treaty will allow us to. And just to go back to the pendulum, the reason why we have limitations and exceptions is because world um, treaties allow that to create that balance against between rights owners and users of information. Um, so I think, um, and also, our law currently is in convention, I mean, in con uh, conflict with our own constitution regarding disabled people. We're actually breaching international conventions on human rights and disabilities. And this will legalize that. It will put us in, in um, line with our con uh, constitution. We cannot allow that to continue. And we have to allow this bill to go through for that very reason.
Um, just wanted to say thank you to all our panelists. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> and thank you to you all for being here as well. The conversation takes place on both sides. It doesn't really happen one-sided. So we thought from our perspective of recreating Wikimedia that we needed to have this conversation and take into consideration what the press has been publishing and to actually show that the bill isn't being passed for no reason and this is testament to that, I think, in front of you. Um, won't keep you any longer. Our panelists are not running away. If you have a question that you feel wasn't answered, we would like them to answer. Please feel free to engage in discussion with them informally. There's food that's been laid out around. There's drinks available. So please enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.